Uh, in the spirit of uh, meta-poetic statements, uh, I'll make some meta-presentation statements. Um, one is that by this point of the conference, um, I found that many of the themes uh, that I relate to in this presentation were discussed. And uh, I do make some speculations here. There are some kind of uh, specula speculative areas in this presentation that I hope just will be conducive to the conversation. Um, another uh, uh, introductory note is that uh, earlier this year, the Udaya Aditi Alankaram was published as a small book by the Center of Excellence for Studies in Classical Canada uh, at the Central Institute of Indian Languages, along with an English translation and notes written by Arvies Sundaram and myself. Uh, my presentation today is based on this publication and will introduce some of the text themes. Dr. Sundaram led this translational project, and I know he would have loved to join um, this Dundin Mela uh, if circumstances had allowed. I also um, want to thank Eagle Bronner, Anne Monis, and Devin Patel for their assistance in bringing um, this publication to light. And lastly, uh, I want to mention another uh, work published by the Center, a book that has relevance for this uh, workshop, Mahakavya Lakshana, uh, originally written in Canada, I think in, yeah, in 1969, by uh, T. V. Venkatachala Shastri, and recently translated to English um, by uh, Nagaraja Rao, uh, who fortunately is here with us. In terms of concept, structure, definitions, and examples, the Udaya Aditya Alankaram, uh, which from now on I will call the Udaya, follows the presentation of poetics in Dundin's Mirror, with some influences from Sri Vijaya's 9th century Kaviraja Margam, as well as from other works on Sanskrit poetics. The relationship between the Udaya and the two canonical texts just mentioned is complex. To begin with, in spite of the broad Dundin-like framework of the Udaya and its adoption of claims about Kannada courtly poetry made by Sri Vijaya in the Margam, no mention is made of these, <coughs> of these two canonical texts in the Udaya Aditya Alankaram. And there is a kind of a broader recurring element here with um, when Dandin is not mentioned, how do we know we are in a Dandin territory? Where are the uh, outer boundaries of this circle of influence? Um, it's just a question that, you know, uh, popped in my mind as I was working on this work, and I'll try to address it. The author of the Udaya briefly acknowledges other poetic theorists and poets, but not these two. Um, Sri Vijaya is the other one. Another fact that complicates the relationship between the Udaya and the two canonical texts is that there are points on which the Udaya deviates from what is claimed in them. I will uh, refer to and discuss these points during the presentation. The Udaya um, is a peculiar text due to its plainness, consisting of only 76 verses. The text offers a highly condensed guidebook for the composition of literature, according to the conventions of Sanskrit poetics, with particularly long 49 verse section dedicated to alankaras, or poetic embellishments. The extreme brevity of the Udaya stands out among alankara shastras, and I had a conversation with Nagarajur Rao about finding other such short texts, um, and which there are not many. It is interesting to compare the Udaya with the other Kannada texts discussed in this panel, the previously mentioned Kaviraja Margam, the 9th century Margam, chronologically located at the beginning of the Canada Golden Age of courtly literary production, can be described as an ambitious, original, polemical, expansive, and also successful endeavor to invent a sophisticated literary culture governed by pan-Indian Sanskritic literary idiom of Kavya, but also attuned to local literary practices. In contrast, the 12th century Udaya, situated at a rather mature moment in the history of this literary culture, reflects much more modest and pragmatic aspirations in terms of its format, structure, and content. While the author of the Marga maintains an extended conversation with Dundin and other literary theorists on various features of poetic composition, the author of the Udaya is content with pithy statements that, compared with the other texts discussed here, fall short in providing an exhaustive treatment of any poetic subject. The question arises, why would anyone take the trouble to compose a very short and, by definition, incomplete treatise on Sanskrit poetics 
in the literary culture of 12th century courtly Canada, after at least three centuries of the flourishing of the genre. Rather than providing a herme hermetic, hermetic answer to this question, I will point to several possible ways of relating to it, in the hope that this will assist in thinking more broadly about the rich ways in which the poetic legacy of Dundin unfolded over the centuries in the terrain of Canada literary culture, as well as elsewhere. Um, some historical background. Um, information regarding where and when the Udaya was composed is not provided in the text. But in verse 24, the author refers to King Udaya Aditya as the Chola King Udaya Aditya, son of King Somanatha. And some scholars think this attribution <coughs> connects the text to a king named Udaya of the Chola dynasty in 12th century Warangal, uh, based on an inscription uh, from that area, but we, Sundaram and I couldn't locate the inscription. It's, it's claimed by Sita Ramaya that he doesn't provide reference to. Um, so kind of turning our uh, investigation mode into the text itself, in verse 75, the author refers to Munja Bhoja and the famous Sri Harsha. The former, the former two are probably two kings of the Paramara dynasty from the 11th century Maharashtra area. And the third, the famous Sri, uh, Sri Harsha, refers to King Sri Harsha Vardhana of the 7th century. What is shared among these three poets is, uh, I just gave him the answer, <laughs> right? What is shared among these three kings is that they are, are also commemorated as poets or poeticians or uh, literary theorists. Um, and uh, this acumen, in fact, is claimed by this text to be shared with King Udayaditya himself, although he does this in Canada and on a much smaller scale. Since Munja and Bhoja are dated at the 11th century, we can assume the Udaya was composed after that. At the other end of the chronological scale, a Kannada text from the middle of the 13th century called Sukti Sudharnava directly quotes from the Udaya. So with these partial indications, most scholars estimate that the Udaya was composed sometime uh, during the 12th century, uh, and I tentatively assume this as well. This is the verse I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, Chola King Udayaditya, son of King Somanatha. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the authorship. Again, a recurring motif in this uh, workshop. The authorship of the text is unclear. On the one hand, King Udayaditya is referred to several times in the text as an accomplished poet, with conventional appellations such as crown, jewel of poets, ocean of literature, and so on, although no other work is attributed to him. And again, we need to contrast this, I think, with the, with the Munja Bhoja, Sri Harsha, famous uh, prolific Sanskrit poets, uh, which this king was not. Um, verse 24 claims that it is this king who composed the text. And I just want us to, to pen, doesn't matter the details themselves, but the fact that this king presented in this manner, the Baba Bam, the, all the poetic elements, this man called the ocean of literature will now present the embellishments, right? Per Dapan, in future sense, he will say, he will utter, he will present. Um, on the other hand, many other verses in Dudai refer to King Udaya Aditya in the second person, vocative, Sambodhana Vibhakti. Furthermore, the text is replete with poetic examples that shamelessly aggrandize this king. And this is verse 22, only two verses before the one just cited, uh, which exemplifies this. The Kantaguna, a particular element, refers to representing what is proper in this world, as in this sentence. Listen, King Udaya, scion of the solar dynasty. The world has attained its goal with your ascendance. The voice that extols the king permeates the Udaya and has implications to which I will return later. But the bifurcation of the text authorial entity into two separate <laughs> voices, one that relates to the king as a text author and uh, another that addresses the king as its direct and immediate audience, Right, brings to mind a similar confusion about the Margam, which we just discussed earlier, but I'm just mentioning that it may be more endemic that, than we think. Uh, uh, for which early modern scholarship, as Sarah mentioned, tended to assume King Nripatunga Mogavarsha as its author, while more contemporary scholars assigned this role to his courtly poet Sri Vijaya. In a similar vein, it is possible to assume that the author of the Udaya was King Udaya Aditya's courtly poet, one whose name is not provided in the text itself, and that this work was patronized by the king, who is allegedly the work's source of literary inspiration. So again, we need to reconcile those uh, obscurities. 
The Udaya gained recognition from later Kannada authors, as indicated by the above mentioned reference to it in the Sukti Sudharnava, as well as in another treatise on dramatic composition from the 16th century titled the Rasaratnakara. In the handout, uh, do we have the handout? Yes. Uh, uh, which actually I'm, I, will not, I will not expand uh, and go into detail here, but I just wanted to kind of as, as an illustration <coughs> for you to see the genealogies of, uh, genealogies of Kannada compositions on poetics, uh, including the works that we are discussing. Uh, just something to think with. The 13th century Sukti, uh, Sukti Sudharnava is the first anthology in the history of Kannada literature, and its significance stems from the fact that it mirrors how courtly lit literary culture in Canada conceptualized and commemorated its own legacy at this moment in time, with quotations from previous treatises and poems in Canada. The author of the Sukti Sudarnava pays tribute to King Udaya Aditya, and according to TV Venkatachala Shastri, the organization of the Sukti Sudarnava directly draws on the Udaya. I want to demonstrate this. This is a pretty, actually, very quite familiar list of 18 uh, description themes. Um, the central topic around which the Sukti Sudarnava is organized is the standard list of 18 themes, usually called angas, that merit elaborate descriptions in a grand poem, Mahakavya. The 18 themes include a city, a king, a war, seasons of the year, and so on, and their presentation in the Sukti Sudarnava corresponds with that of the Udaya. Uh, this specific verse from the Udaya also appealed, <coughs> also appealed to modern historians of Kannada literature. When D. L. Narasimachar discusses in an essay from 1926 descriptions of elements of nature in classical Kannada poetry, he quotes the same verse from the Udaya in order to present to his readers all 18 themes. Similarly, R. Narasimacharya points in 1929 to this verse in the Udaya as the first to list the 18 themes in a single Kannada verse and adds that it influenced later poets. It appears that the specific verse in the Udaya about the 18 themes of a grand poem had an appeal for later writers since it presented for the first time in the history of Kannada poetics the same list as that one found in Dandin's Mirror in a single Kanda Padya verse. Uh, Kanda Padya being the standard meter in Kannada Shastras. In other words, King Udaya or the author takes uh, Dandin's list of 18 uh, elements or angas and pronounces them in this meter, one meter. In contrast, Sri Vijaya, the author of the Kannada Margam, also discusses slightly different themes, um, but he does so in a more elaborate manner over four discursive verses. The condensed nominal presentation of the description in the Udaya was evidently an easy and useful reference for later writers, including modern ones. Another verse in the Udaya with intertextual significances is verse 6, which discusses Chattana or uh, Chitrayatana, as uh, uh, Vikatachala Shastri writes, and Vaidandika or Bedande, two literary forms in Kannada literature. Uh, we don't have to go into all this uh, discussion as we had already, but, but I, wa I want to kind of point something very strange, right? In the 9th century, when the Marga mentions Chattana and Bedande, and he actually provides us with some descriptions about rhythm and, and mixture, um, we can easily assume that, that that sort of composition practice in Canada existed in some form, either before that or during that period. Right now we are in the 12th century, right, in a very short work that follows Dundee very carefully, and still the author persists about uh, mentioning Sargabandha, the, the kind of uh, one of the Canada or Sanskrit equivalences to uh, Mahakavya is famed, uh, but here the sense that it happens in Canada is Shatana and Vaidandika, and he doesn't provide us with anything more, right? We don't have any work in Canada that is associated with these two terms. This is uh, Hapax uh, Logomenon here, as well as in the, in the Sri Vijaya, in the Margam, right? But the fact that, that he does that in 12th century, three centuries after the Margam is, is, is weird, right? I want, it's kind of strange. It's kind of it needs to be addressed. Um, one thing it can be taken as indication to the influence of Sri Vijaya himself, right? That the, when, Uday, when the author writes this text, he has to uh, follow uh, a claim 300 years ago that has no hold in actual uh, literary practices at the time. Another possibility is that these were actually forms of some kind of a literary culture or literary practices that we don't have any written testimony about. Uh, just kind of to 
to kind of throw light on the more or the darker aspects of this uh, literary world. Turning for a moment to the structure of the Udaya as a whole, this short one chapter text can be divided into two main segments. This is the first segment. The first segment from verses 1 to 24, you can see the verse numbers. I hope this is readable uh, despite the size. 1 to 24 introduces major poetical issues and elements of poetry with borrowings from Dandin, Sri Vijaya, and others. As indicated on the screen, this segment opens with an invocation to Sarasvati, then moves on uh, for why writing the book, the definition of poetry and its division into three parts, poetic styles and taste, ritis and rasas, uh, grand poems and their themes, mahakavyas, angas, and poetic forms of expression or gunas, um, including an explanation and example for each of them. In 23 verses, the author of Dudaya, and the 24th is a kind of a transitional, <coughs> transitional verse, uh, the author of Dudaya makes a quick run through major aspects of Sanskritic poetics, and with the exception of his treatment of the gunas, he avoids going into any detail or providing elaborate examples. For example, we don't get any dosha, any discussion of, of uh, such elements. To illustrate the author's tendency for brevity, we can point uh, to what he does not tell us. As I mentioned, the doshas, that would be one, but I want to give a particular uh, uh, demonstration. Dandin's presentation of a grand poem, which runs from verse 14 to verse 22 in the first chapter of the mirror, includes statements such as the following. Um, it is embellished, lengthy, carrying rasa and bhava throughout, with chapters that are not too long, made of meters that are pleasing to the ear, uh, and with good thematic progression. Uh, Sri Vijaya, the author of the Margam, describes the grand poem in a manner similar to that of Dandin, not identical, uh, adding his own original thoughts on the subject, although he places the section on the grand poem, uh, which in his text consists of 15 verses, at the very end of his work, which is peculiar, and I'm putting that as a side note. Um, but in contrast to these two uh, authors, uh, the author of Dudaya condenses his discussion of a grand poem into three short descriptive uh, verses very close to the opening of the text, and instead of developing a discussion about different kinds of poems, he sends the reader <coughs> to other works. Um, yeah, and others, uh, let them be known from definitions found in other literary works. A succinct approach to major topics in poetics also characterizes the author's presentation of poetic styles called ritis or margas. In two verses only, seven and eight, he states that there are many ritis and names three of them, uh, Vaidarbha, Gauda, and Panchala. And again, uh, I, can, I can quickly refer to John Luke's presentation uh, of the uh, Maran Alankaram, I think, the Tamil text, which also uh, enumerates these three. Uh, by doing this, the author of Dudaya diverges from both Dandin and Sri Vijaya's bipartite division of Vi Vaidarbha and Gauda, or northern and southern, and aligns with literary theorists like Vamana from the 9th century and others. His naming of poetic styles as Ritis and not Margas also indicates the influence of later writers like King Bhoja, and he avoids partiality regarding one Riti or another, like we find in the previous text. And what, what I'm saying here, in other words, is that we have specific places of not original claims, but different claims than what we see with Dundin. Dundin's present, well, you want me to read the same page again or go to the next one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, another point uh, at which the author of Dudaya deviates from the two canonical authors is in his count of rasas or aesthetic taste as nine rather than eight, as in uh, Dundin, and in the assigning of each rasa to a specific riti. We should know that this assigning, which appears to be unique to this text, um, and maybe you know, others could correct me on this, uh, is presented in the Udaya in a minimal and succinct manner with a lesser sense of the polemics that characterizes both the mirror and the margam. Um, but you know, this is just uh, an interesting, maybe the most interesting verse in, in, in sense of its original claims that rasas are assigned to particular styles and so on. Uh, quickly moving on. The second major segment of the Udaya from verses 25 to 73 deals with alankaras or embellishments. Then we have three kind of concluding verses. Mm, this segment makes up the bulk of the short text <coughs> and serves as the source for its central theme, as indicated by 
its, its full title, Udaya Aditya Alankaram, or the Alankaras of King Udaya Aditya. Following Dandin, the author of the Udaya enumerates 35 Alankaras, and I know that Dandin enumerates 35 because I counted it with Igal two days ago. Um, um, these are 35 Arta Alankaras, right, meaning based embellishments, usually dedicating one verse to each embellishment with only slight variations from Dandin's typology, such as in the titles of several Alankaras, <coughs> something that we already found in, um, in the Margam as the Ven effectively showed us. At the end of this segment, the author mentions also Yamaka and Prahelika, which he terms as unconventional, amargam. Um, in perfect agreement with Gary Tubbs' comment on Sunday that Yamaka is a favorite vice of Sanskrit poets, both rejected and avidly practiced, um, the author of Dudaya, right after declaring that Yamaka is unconventional, provides a verse that illustrates it. Right? And uh, I only no noticed that after uh, Gary made his comment, and it just goes to show you not only <coughs> Gary's, Gary's inspirations to, uh, to us, uh, his students, but only that also that when Gary makes such a statement, the Indian authors quickly follow suit <laughs> also. In the long section about embellishments, the author of Dudaya will usually present a brief definition, Lakshana, and here I'm touching another, maybe painful, uh, question with, with regard to Dundin. Uh, the author will usually present a brief definition, Lakshana, of the embellishment, and then provide an example, Lakshya, uh, for it. While the first embellishment discussed by the author, Swab of Okti, takes a verse and a half, the one that follows, the foundational simile, Upame, uh, takes I, I enjoy saying Upame instead of Upama, right, kind of to, to uh, celebrate Canada, the Canada uniqueness, um, takes as little as the remainder of the same verse. Yeah, it's here. You are like Karna. Okay, that's the uh, Lakshya. Oh, Udaya Aditya, when this is said in comparison, it is upame, simile. The presentation of rupaka, possibly translated as metaphor, in the verse that follows is slightly longer. O Lord, um, O Lord of the earth, gem ornament among the best poet kings, not saying the face resembles the moon, but saying in a comprehensive manner, for me this is truly a moon face, is rupaka. And I want us to pay attention to the author's strategy for explaining embellishments, as evinced in these two verses. To begin with, the concise nature of the text precludes the possibility of breaking down each embellishment to subtypes, which is one of the hallmarks of Dandin's mirror, and which is also characteristics of Sri Vijaya's Margam. Here, in comparison, each embellishment is presented, presented only in its skeletal, most basic form. In addition, the author of Dudaya pays less attention to the embellishment's lakshana, its definition or guidance, and more to its lakshya, its illustration or example. Now, the fact that I wasn't last night is it's detrimental because I know that was a central topic that you discussed. Um, and, and before I'll continue, but just to, um, I, know I heard an argument that Kavya Adarsha is not called Kavya Adarsha, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's Kavya. Not text. What is found is. Kavya Lakshana, right? So this is just to problematize again the questioning of the Lakshana and the function of Lakshana that perhaps Dandin seems what he's doing as Lakshana. Um, but here, okay, so but, but the reason I, I the, the, my entry into this question of Lakshana is the fact that, and I, I, I think we can see a beginning of that trend in the Kaviraja Margam also, but here it's accentuated, the Lakshana becomes less and less um, I don't know, explicit or lengthy. Um, I want to illustrate this difference uh, by reading uh, how Dandin explains Rupaka metaphor, or as uh, Eagle translated this, identification. Um, identification, I'm not showing this, I'll just read. Identification is nothing but a simile wherein difference is obscured. Okay. And Sri Vijaya follows suit with a similar logic. The author of the Udaya vaguely states in the above verse, 
uh, saying in a comprehensive manner is metaphor or identification, rupaka. Um, and, and again, a kind of parenthesis uh, comment, uh, when, when Sundaram and I came to translate this in a comprehensive way, we, and this is again, can, can be as a reflection on the act of translation from one language to another of this metapoetic language. Samantu uh, usir dode, when, when it is said neatly, in Canada, neatly, Samantu, neatly, beautifully, when it is said beautifully, it is metaphor. And when Sundaram and I had to tr take decisions, right, strategic decisions on how we want to supply the reader with some kind of useful information, we changed it into saying in a comprehensive manner, just to gesture towards something which is totalistic, as Rupaka is, right, this kind of totalistic combination. Um, therefore, the Udaya presents Rupaka, and now kind of returning to the original sense, if we say it beautifully, he doesn't really provide its readers with any substantial lakshana for this particular embellishment. Uh, not all the embellishments in the Udaya are missing their explanations. Most of the presentations of embellishment include an explanation directly borrowed from Dandin, although usually in a truncated manner. And this is a comparison of, of the treatment of uh, Tulya Yogita, uh, which actually is renamed in the text into Sama Yoga. Um, and again, I'm, I'm relying on Eagle's uh, translation. The yoke of equivalence, this is Dandin, is when either in order to praise or condemn it, an entity is made uh, the equal of others whose relevant attributes are meant to be understood as far greater. And we had already, we, we're a little bit familiar with this from before. And in contrast, what we have here uh, is much more simplified. Taking into consideration similar qualities between two things is called Sama Yoga. What's the importance here? It is possible to conclude in a broader fashion that in his discussion of the technical terrain of poetic embellishments, the author of the Udaya is not invested in a well-argued, complete, or discursive presentation of the embellishments. And I'm not saying that Dundin was, but compared to Dundin, he's far less, that's for sure. Rather than focusing on the Lakshan Hour guideline, he provides an elaborate Lakshya application or example for each embellishment, one which is usually not borrowed from the mirror but it is original, right? The Lakshya, the examples are original in the Udaya and usually are about King Udaya Aditya's fantastic qualities. Um, with this cursory tapestry of selected verses from the Udaya in mind, I now turn to the conclusion of my presentation with the consideration of the overall purpose and consequent significances of the Udaya. And here, um, speculative is, is, is key for uh, for um, what I'm going to say. First of all, the discursive, or I, I, I try to argue for these things. I'm trying to argue here. Um, first of all, the discursive brevity of the Udaya stems from its format. A very short text aims to present in Canada major aspects of the production of literature as it is conceptualized and discussed in the Sanskritic discourse of courtly poetics, with particular attention to Dandin's presentation in the mirror and that of Sri Vijaya in the Margams, in the Margam, but also specifically diverging from these texts and incorporating statements by later literary theorists, as in the case of the tripartite division of Ritis and the nine types of Rasa. Within the limited format of the Udaya, the author elaborates on two elements of literary composition, uh, forms of expression, or gunas, and embellishments, or alankaras. Both are recognized as some of Dandin's most significant contributions to poetics. But the elaboration on these two subjects in Dudaya is narrow in scope, with usually only one verse per element. Thus, the text's overall portrayal of poetics is inherently limited, one that is incapable of projecting a comprehensive vision uh, of how to produce literature as the mirror and the margam do. Right, and I think that's a key, a, a kind of a comparative, which I did throughout this presentation, the Margam, Dandin in the background and the Margam versus the Udaya. This text is much more modest and short. The compactedness of the Udaya and its far greater interest in exemplifying poetic elements rather than in defining or explaining them are indicative of the text purpose. By articulating basic foundational schemas and concepts about courtly poetry, 
in the popular and relatively easy Kandapadya meter, which is also shared by the Kaviraja Marga, this text provided a comfortable and accessible introduction to poetics, an introduction that was probably easy to memorize and invoke whenever a specific guna or alankara was considered. This, this supposition touches on the question of Dudaya's intended audience. In fact, the author answers the question in verse 2. I could have started the presentation with that and be done with it. Um, right at the beginning of the text, for the sake of inspired youngsters glowing in their attempts to write poetry, I make known this short text. Having considered the simplified vision of court literary composition in Canada provided by Dudaya, the author's statement regarding his intended audience makes good sense. Those inspired, inspired youngsters, Shri Bharita Balakar, could acquire, by working with Dudaya, a basic understanding of major poetic themes. They could formally distinguish between works of verse, works of prose, and works that combine both forms. They could catalogue certain poetic forms of expression, gunas, according to their attributed styles or ritis, uh, while quoting one example for each. They could immediately recall a particular embellishment, say, the yoke of equivalence, by reciting a poetic example together with a minimal and quite general definition in their pursuit to compose poetry. Notwithstanding the applied usefulness of this text, it is difficult to assume it could have fully catered these students' need for becoming established Paka poets. From this perspective, the Udaya served a limited role, and we might think of it as a short handbook or an addendum to a far broader curriculum, or as one tool within a larger toolbox about poetics. How did that toolbox uh, look like? It's, I think it's an interesting question. One, one of the possible answers is to just to look at the genealogies in Sanskrit and Canada and even Telugu um, that, that uh, you know, article. But it, it also points to the, to the language in which we are working. We're in Canada, right? Um, does this audience uh, know Sanskrit? To what extent? Uh, are the Sanskrit works accessible to these uh, readers? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll leave this uh, question open. Um, standing next to the students of poetry, we have the teachers. Subsequent references to the Udaya show that this text was also used by accomplished Kannada literary theorists in order to quickly refer to central elements in poetic composition. In other words, there is sufficient, though not abundant, testimony to suggest that through the later history of Kannada poetics, the Udaya, the Udaya has filled a necessary role as a basic technical reference book or an abridged pedagogical manual on the principles of Kannada literature. Before concluding this presentation, I wish to mention another feature of this text, one that probably also served as a strong incentive for its composition, if not its uh, raison d'etre, and that is its frequent and hyperbolic attributions to King Udaya Aditya. Excuse me. As implied by the title of the work, The Embellishment of King Udaya Aditya, this text's celebrated protagonist is its source of inspiration as well as its main addressee, a person who, if we only believe this short text, is a gifted poet, a generous patron of poetry, and also an invisible fighter. In as many as 30 verses out of a total of 76, most of which are found in the section on embellishments, King Udaya is praised with all the stock phrases reserved for outstanding poets, such as the crown jewel of poets and the gem ornament among the best of poet kings, and is also described as generous as the divine tree, the lord of the earth, he is valorous as the storming elephant, one whose enemies survive his blow only by fleeing from the battlefield. The presence of the king is so ubiquitous in the text that one cannot escape the suspicion the Udaya was composed, partly at least, in order to serve the vanity and aggrandizement of a local ruler. 
the author himself seems to ironically comment about the king's insatiable claim for fame. When right before the grand declaration in verse 24, and verse 24 is a key verse, kind of, uh, if we divide uh, the whole work. So right before the grand declaration in verse 24 that this whole work is to the king's credit, the author casually provides in verse 23 the following example for a particular form of expression. The lauder's tongue is sharp in praising the king's qualities. Read in context, this statement suggestively undercuts the king's claim of authorship that immediately follows. I would say in conclusion that as much as this text is read as the king's presentation, the king's presentation of poetic embellishments, it probably also served as an embellishment of the king in written form. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Uh, before we, people ask questions about the second half of your presentation, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, well, first of all, uh, give you a hypothesis and then maybe ask you a question. Uh, you asked about this, uh, I think one of the reasons why the Mahakavya is probably theorized l later in the work than, say, in the beginning, because a uh, Dundin begins with it, and uh, the Kaviraja Marga and the Udaya Aditya you mentioned culminate on some level. No, no, no. It, it's also in the beginning. It's in the beginning, okay. Yeah. Well, one of the hypotheses would be that, of course, you know, if, if as you're suggesting, this is a kind of a, uh, a text for working poets, for things that are for, you know, you could see why it would be kind of, well, at least in the Marga, this is a th hypothesis that it might culminate the work in, in some ways as a kind of, you know, a leaving off that this is now the other direction uh, moving towards Sanskrit literary production, you know, that you want to move Canada towards that direction and you want to pull it in that direction. The curiosity I have question for you is that why do you think the champu, which of course within a century, half a century, becomes such a major genre in Canada, how come aside from, you know, the mention of Gadde Katha in the, in the Margam and here, mm -hmm. how, how come the champu is not, in your estimation, more heavily theorized in these works? Um, I, I, I mean, my initial, I, d d d Champu in, in general is a, is a kind of a, you know, it's a strange fruit, right? It's kind of, uh, maybe it came from Prakrit into Sanskrit. I don't know, maybe Nagarajara will comment on this later on. It's, it has a, um, um okay, uh, but, but, so, so let me say it simply. I, I don't think I have enough, uh, understanding of Champu Kavya or, or this literary culture in general to give. Uh, kind of a concrete answer. But just a comment on what you mentioned as the kind of the culmination of the Kaviraja Margam as, and here is how Mahakavya is, is composed, right, at the end. It's like the last class seminar, right, when we all sit together and think about ways for the future is interesting. I, but just to, just to throw a different way of explaining, and I, 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 in, uh, not in any uh, finite way, is that perhaps it's, it's a, an attempt to marginalize Mahakavya. Um, um, yeah, okay, it's a, okay, it's a conversation, but uh, j yeah, okay. Maybe if Nagaraja Rao wants to comment on Champu. Yeah. In Canada, the real uh, poetic works started with Champu. See, whether it is uh, Pampas or Rannas, all these works are Champu. And therefore, there were many Canada scholars who were uh, maintaining that actually the genre of uh, Champu <laughs> came to Sanskrit via Kannada. No. Because uh, uh, the famous uh, Champu, Nala Champu, that is the earliest uh, Champu, recognized Champu by that name you know, that we have in Sanskrit. But when we read Ratnashri, it becomes clear that even before Dandin, Champu was there in Kannada, in, in Sanskrit. Because Ratnashri very clearly gives uh, uh, the Jatakamala as the example for Champu. Jatakamala of Aryashura, which was composed in the 4th century AD. And other works also, Ratnashri has uh, mentioned under 
ಗದ್ಯಪದ್ಯಮಯಿ ಚಂಪುಹು ಆಫ್ ದಂಡಿನ್ ಹವೆವರ್ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಯಲಿ ದಿ ಚಂಪು ಫಾರಮ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲರ್ ಫಾರಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಲಿಟ್ರೇಚರ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅರ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ ಚಂಪು ಫಾರಮ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಈ ಒಂದು ಇನ್ ದಿ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಗಿಲ್ ಗೇವ್ ಅಸ್ ದಟ್ ಚತ್ತಾಣ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬೆದಂಡೆ ಅಸ್ ಮಹಾಕಾವ್ಯಾಸ್ ಐ ಐ ಡಿಸಗ್ರಿ ವಿತ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಒಪಿನಿಯನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ಲಿಯರ್ ವರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಸಮ್ ವರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಮೇನ್ ಫೀಚರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಚತ್ತಾಣ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬೆದಂಡೆ ಆರ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆ ಆರ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಫಾರಮ್ ಆಫ್ ವೈ ದಿ ಬೆದಂಡೆ ವೈದಂಡಿಕಾ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಫಾರಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೋಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಚತ್ತಾಣ ಈಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಫಾರಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಮ್ ಸಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸರ್ಗಬಂಧ ಅಸ್ ವಿ ಕಾಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಫ್ ವಿ ಕ ಕಾಲ್ ದಿ ಮಹಾ ಮಹಾಕಾವ್ಯ ಸರ್ಗಬಂಧ ಸರ್ಗಬಂಧೋ ಮಹಾಕಾವ್ಯಂ ಮೇನ್ಲಿ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಡಿವೈಡೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಸರ್ಗಾಸ್ ಸಚ್ ಎ ವರ್ಕ್ ಡಿಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ದರ್ ವಾಸ್ ನೋ ಮಹಾಕಾವ್ಯ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಅನದರ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಸೈಜ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಕಾವ್ಯ ರಾಜ ಮಾರ್ಗಂ ದಟ್ ಮೆನ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಚತಾನ ಅಂಡ್ ಎಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಡೆಫಿನೆಟ್ಲಿ ಡೆಫಿನೆಟ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸಾರ ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿ ದೇರ್ ನೋ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಕಾವ್ಯ ರಾಜ ಮಾರ್ಗಂ yeah no in other in other work other than the not the no no, no no in other works also the de, in kaviraj marga definition is not given uh-huh. only the mention the number uh, the name of chattana and bedande it is given in the kaviraj marga mm-hmm. but in other works mm-hmm. what is chattana what is bedande about those things mentions are there okay. Okay. and they do not fit the lakshana of mahakavya at all and so in kannada there was no mahakavya at least in those times and another point you know while uh, yeah, we were uh, reading the udiyaditya alankara he mentions about nataka yes you know. yes but know. in kannada there is no nataka until the 19th century there is <coughs> not a single nataka in kannada literature and therefore while he is uh talking about <coughs> nataka etc he must be thinking about the sanskrit, sanskrit. drama no. or that uh, sanskrit prakrit drama that we have and uh, and not kannada uh, dramas yeah. that is what i think if, if i if i can make a comment on that is that is emblematic i think of the um i don't know kind of almost deliberate uh a m- m- mashing of sanskrit and kannada which occurs at so many levels right the, the text doesn't tell us when he refers to sanskrit rarely rarely he separates sanskrit from kannada but i think the most the the, the strongest point to demonstrate is, is the language itself right how the language feels comfortable with 60 to 80% of words in sama sanskrita um and and in other words um there is something to be thought in this uh or or by mentioning munja bhoja and shri harsha together with me right a, a small kannada poet in a particular place with these sanskritic uh poets so just just a comment on that i i wanted to just in connection with these um genre questions um i think it is important that he singles out munja and bhoja as examples along with shri harsha uh in part because of the the question of champu and what tr- what is champu what is this form that has become enormously popular in karnataka um long before uh, this text and i think that the yashastilika champu and the champu ramayana that come from the uh, paramara court are kind of very present to um to this imagination um but you know there's a there's a question of when we s- when we think about the relationships between these different genres when we think about the way that um that this author has presented them um it's um there's a a kind of equivalence to come back to what i was saying uh, earlier um champu is vachanakavya so champu is a sanskrit thing vachanakavya is the is the kannada thing and i think that he's drawing the same kind of equivalence between uh, um the mahakavya and these uh, uh, kannada forms yeah. but it's 
Um, the equivalence for historical reasons might be problematic. It's not clear that anyone really knows what these genres actually are. But I think that it's, it's important to literally mirror the Sanskrit world in the Kannada world and vice versa. I, I, implicit, implicitly making a very strong claim, right? Implicitly, we, we talked about this, we questioned what, are, what is being claimed by not making an explicit claim is that we are, this is the same universe, right? Or this universe is equivalent. So. Hi, I'm gonna thank you so much, Gil, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the framing of the, um, of the Lakshana in the in the vocative. Um, could you say a little bit about the relationship between the articulation of these vocatives, which often employ figures uh, discussed by the, by the Alankara text, um, and the Lakshya, um, the, uh, and the Lakshya of the same, of the same section? Yeah, if, if um, I understand your question correctly, um, and if so, it's very. I'm, yeah, I'm glad. It's a great question. Uh, sometimes these, uh, right, these sambodanas, are appear inside the lakshya, inside the quotation, and sometimes they, you syntactically, right, they are placed outside the yembudu, yembudu kind of the iti, right, the, the Kannada iti. They are outside it, and then, and again, that it's, it's exactly that that tension, right? This this uh, absurdity, even, right. Uh, this king composed this, oh, king, right, and so on. It's like a, what, a schizophrenic, right? A person who is a king writing to himself and praising himself. So that's the only way of reading it simply. Uh, so well, and so do you see a relationship when you, do, when you look at the language of these vocatives, are, are, uh, of the vocatives that are outside the yenbada, the, the, the vocative of, of the, we might say, the vocative of the lakshana, mm -hmm. um, is there a relationship between that language, the figures that are used, and the, and the particular figure being discussed? Or the lakshya that's being, pr the, the example that's being presented as, as lakshya? It's a, yeah, it's a, I, I don't know, okay. I would need to look, but, but it's, it's kind of a, right, it's a prompt to do with this kind of typology, right, of following each one, and, but it's a very promising, yeah, thought. Um, I can't recall the particular context, but you said that uh, the author is sends his readers to other texts with yeah. regards to, so I, was, I wondered if you think he means Canada texts or Sanskrit texts, because in the Lila Tilakam, for example, uh, the author sends in, in when discussing the, the question of Alankaras that are not explained, he particularly mentions that the author should go to look at the Sanskrit text. Um, but but so. that that sort of a, you know a referential explicitness is 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 absent here, and maybe well. maybe deliberately, maybe de deliberately again maybe this is attempt. But, but, but it touches also on the question of readership. Again, and I'm kind of throwing that maybe readers have access to these broader Sanskrit. In my, in my mind, when he refers to other, so let's to, to roll back to that. Uh, in my mind, when he refers at that particular point, I think it was uh, Nataka. So if we, you know, if we do one plus one and get Nagaraja Rao's comment that Nataka has only appeared in Canada at a later period, then this is, this is Sanskrit. Thanks very much, Gil, for your paper. Really, really interesting. What was fascinating as someone who's just beginning to learn Kannada, listening to the descriptions of these two texts, uh, the Margam and the Udaya, is some of their striking similarities, but also uh, some undeniable differences, the most obvious of which, at least according to the descriptions, is the dramatically different treatments of Shabdalankara. Um, so in the Margam, we have the order of the Kaviraja Margam change. That's chap the second part is devoted to Shabdalankara, long treatment. Here we just have there's something unconventional. Of what do you think that's an index? Uh, do you have any thoughts on what that might be pointing to in terms of, despite the superficial uh, similarities perhaps of kingly patrons and questionable authorship, it seems an index of something important, very different projects, these very different treatments of Shabdalankara. Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, again, I, I, I shifted to this just to illustrate, right? Uh, Shabdalankara Yamaka, right? Um, and, and Prohedika is already outside that strict uh, definition. One verse, two verses, right at the at the end, calling it amarga, right? Um, again, if we if we speculation, if we follow on this Shri Bharita Balakaru, 
right, those youngsters, maybe Shabda Lankara. And it's, it's an interesting comment on Shabda, right, this Chitra Kavya, these, these are gray areas. On one hand, they are argued against. Uh, on, on the other hand, you get a sense that they are really a virtuoso, right? It's the field of the virtuoso, the Shabda, by definition, right? It kind of implies this, uh, even a metaphysical realm of connecting uh, phonemes in new and exciting ways, which, which Abdal Ankara, right, the, the, the embellishment of sound, right, implies. So maybe it was just too advanced, maybe too advanced of a topic for, for these modest uh, beginners. Uh, I am actually giving some examples to illustrate what is Champu is uh, m uh, the idea of Champu, I think, is actually sound com combinations are that are naturally found in a given language. So from language to language, they differ. Mm. For example, a part of Sanskritic uh, uh, f form would be like Akandala, Kanda, Gunashanda, Mandita, Pandita, Janapundarika, Marthanda, Marthanda, Kulodbhut, Bhunadishwara, etc., etc., it goes. Now, in, in Singhala, for example, we have uh, a kind of sound combination that comes naturally in Singhalese. Now, uh, if I were to see, you write something in prose, Mese unsanda de dena. So that's normal prose. So pun sande udaya gin gili avata se dene. Amane mande nala sandun si hil gini se dene. What is Can you remember? So on the malpeti atula yahane katu se dene. Mesande maybe yo du king. Kelesas and a semi ane. Then it goes, it, now this is a kind of wo wo sound formation which is natural to Sinhala language. But this can also be converted to poetry. Now, modern poet uses this combination uh, in describing the rain. He says, Chichiri, chiri, chichiri, chichiri, udaya sita, adha helena podano kadiva, teta bariva, hiri kiten kili polana. So you can easily convert this champu, uh, you know, which is actually, I do not say, which is part of the genius of the kind of language, can be easily put into okay. words form. Uh, so, so the connection with champu and this kind of, you know, this mechanics of uh, prose composition to Shabda Lankara, I, you know, I'm, I'm. Uh, I can only learn about, but um, interestingly, uh, the 71st verse, which, is, which I don't have here on the slides, the demonstration, right, of Yamaka uh, is Ucharana Charana, Ucharana, Ucharana Dol in the, in the battle, uh, the feet of the king, and so on, uh, which are Sanskritic. Uh, again, so, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't want to repeat myself, but again, we are working in a, in a linguistic terrain in which Sanskrit is part, an integral part of articulation, at least in the indexical sense, at least in the, the, the words of usage. I have just a narrow little question on a point of information, since I don't know the language, but when you were talking about the distinction of Rupaka from Upama, you focused on the translation of a single word, Samantha. Samantu yeah, Usirda. Uh, as uh, comprehensively. Yeah. And I, w I didn't quite follow whether it was the statement of resemblance or of identity that was comprehensive, or whether it was the resemblance that was comprehensive, or whether it was the uh, identity that was comprehensive. I, I, was, I, I, I was limited by the author himself, right, by saying Samantus Dode, right, when we say it uh, beautifully. That's the starting point of the translational act. Um, what, we, but, uh, what we try to do by saying comprehensive manner is that the comparison reaches, you know, 100%. It reaches, it it's fused, right, the moon face and so on. Um, but that's actually the identity, yeah. isn't it? Or yeah, uh, but yeah. So I'm not. Maybe I'm not following your question. 
maybe. Yeah. Here? Right. Sorry. Well, if he's thinking of Dundon, I mean, then he says, Kupu to the Upama, Tiro, 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 So instead of the face resembles the moon, right? Uh, in the in the it's a yenage um, to me mogame, right? This face sasi shashi dal indeed dal dal. That's it. Okay. For me. So is it dal? Dal yes, definitely. Definitely, <laughs> truly, truly. <laughs> and which is interesting, right? It doesn't. Yeah, is it compounded? No, it doesn't look compounded, right? No, which it's is not a, which is nice, which is nice, right? It's like it's, it's an advanced. Actually, it's an advanced application of rupaka, following dandin. In a way, it's a subtype of rupaka, because it's not in the compound, right? Asamasta, asamasta rupaka. I keep missing the champu discussion, and it keeps coming up and, and fl flitting away. Um, but I just had a comment, actually, um, and I'm interested to hear what you have to say, Gil, and, and as well, Nagaraja Rao. But um, one of the things, this is one of my favorite topics, um, one of the things that's so striking to me about old Kannada champu is actually the uh, ways in which prose is often not very <coughs> present. Often not? Very present. So one of the things in Champu Kavya is people mm. say, oh, it's a, it's a mixture of prose and verse. And the prose becomes this kind of key defining feature that makes it distinct, that makes it Kavya, or that makes it Champu. But um, you know, even something like the Pampa Bharata, we don't get any prose until like the 50th past the 50th verse, and this is very common. And then even when we do get prose, it'll be something like idendu, or identu, having said in this way. And then it goes straight back into verse. And so actually what's very striking to me and seems to me more defining of champu is the metrical variation, is the actual huge amounts of uh, meters that get marshaled into Kannada champu kavya. And I can't help but think that when we look at, at this text and, and the Kaviraja Marga, that Chaitana and Bidande are actually describing something that might be a forerunner to Champu. What, what those meter or what those genres are are mixed meter compositions across Sanskrit, Kannada uh, meters, and Prakrit meters, and they don't have prose. But I think if we actually start to think about Champu as something more about meter and less about prose then maybe there's more of a connection to those genres and champu than we might think. So that was just a comment. Mm, yeah. so, but when we come to wait, 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 wait for the microphone. <laughs> uh, but when we come to Ranna, etc., there is sufficient prose also no, in the champu. And uh, the later uh, poets have accepted that the mixture of Champu, um, mixture of uh, Gadya and Padya is Champu. And so the Gadya portion may be um, not so much found as in uh, uh, Samskrita Champus. But anyway, that idea is there. Just uh, changing the meters, uh, di different meters are used on account of that. Something is called Champu is a novel idea, new idea. No earlier author has. Uh, uh, explained it like that, as far as I know. Okay, so I just wanted to say that uh, it makes a lot of sense with reference to Malayal to Mali Pravalam shampoos because there you have Gadyams, you always have them, but Gadyams have meters as well and they're Dravidian meters. So it's not real prose in a way that is meterless prose doesn't exist. So you can say you can look at it as these different Sanskritic meters in the Padyam verses and they change also. Th there's a, a and and then there you have these Dravidian uh, 
meet uh, the Guardian. And, and then two, two short comments on that is that um, um, I'm curious about uh, whether there are different forms of expressivity in the switch between, right? And that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful room for making arguments, right? When we shift from meter into prose, and we can immediately point to some kind of change of, of the, you know, the, the, the pulse or the texture or something happens there. Uh, that's one, one comment. Uh, that, um, and, um, and the other comment I forgot. So, <laughs> um, so we'll have to end there, but let's thank Gil again. Okay. Thank you.